Welcome to the podcast. It starts with you, with me, Vic O'Farrell. I ask my guests, by understanding their own behaviours and personality style, what impact on their lives, both personally and professionally, has there been? What is it like to live and work with someone of your style? I mean, this is not about labelling people, putting people in boxes or an excuse for bad behaviour. It's about recognising, understanding and respecting that we're all different. And what impact can you have on others by looking in the mirror? Because it starts with you. So here we are on a yet another episode of It Starts With You. And today I am joined by the gorgeous, delightful, speaker best buddy that I have in the world, Mr. Stephen Whitten. Stephen Hello, Whitten. Vicky. How are you? I'm really well, darling. Really, really well. It's so lovely <laughs> to finally get you on here as well. I know it's taken us ages. I know. Um, everything, everything happens for a reason, right? Exactly. Apparently. Exactly. Oh, it always does. I'm a great believer in that as well, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But for, for our audience, those that are watching or listening, do you want to just let them know a little bit about yourself, but also what it is in terms of personality styles? What's your drivers? <laughs> well, right now, my drivers are, I don't know what's going on, but once again, for the third time in uh, this year, I'm having to resort to the throat sweets because something's happened and I feel like I've got something coming on. But despite that, I will be my usual yellow self, which means that I thrive and drive and live on my optimism and my uh, energy most of the time. And uh, there's a little word that I heard once, which was effusive. Not oh, quite sure what it means, but I'll have it anyway. Say, that's a big word. Can you explain it? It is a big word. I think it means kind of like, Mah! you know, I'm, I'm kind of out there and a bit flamboyant and uh, energetic and creative and all of that sort of stuff. So um, I like to think that's the real me uh, when I get going. But clearly, like probably all high yellows, there are the the times where you resort to the other stuff um, as well. But yeah, so I was in the motor trade for 35 years, uh, obviously started when I was 10. Pause for laughter. That didn't come. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> That was actually funnier than my vain attempt at a joke. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah 35 years and sort of worked various uh, bits but doing eventually sort of training and development stuff and then of course during the pandemic when like everyone else everything sort of collapsed and fell apart uh, which you knew about we might touch on some of that a bit later um i really properly sort of moved into the world of, of speaking mm. uh, and, and sharing my story about mental health in particular and working in a very masculine environment where it was not something you talk about and when I look back on it, it was the high yellow in me, the optimist, the the drive for, you know, wanting to be around people and a bit be energetic, avoid rejection and avoid all that sort of judgment and stuff. It was that that kept me going. Mm. Uh, so uh, so yeah, so now I'm I'm a professional speaker like you are. Uh, we are. But I am also an MC and a show host, an event host, and I absolutely love that. That is right up my strasse. As they say, well, you, you 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 also do a very good job at that, and I think, um, and it's not about different personalities are better speakers or better MCs, but I, having watched you, see that yellow go off the scale, you know, which which is great as an MC. I mean, we know as an MC, it's not all about us; it's about the speakers that are introducing. But you are very good at getting the audience engaged. And I definitely think that's a natural yellow trait to to bring the audience in with you. But just touching there, you say obviously. I think that's because it's it, it's joyous. If if something brings you joy, I think it's easy to to do it and do it well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can see it brings you joy because yeah. I know when you're out there doing that kind of stuff that you that you are joyful. But you said you spent thirty five years in the motor trade industry. Would you say there was a a personality style that was very much in that? You talked about it being a very masculine environment. So if we look at the the front of house people, you know, the sales people in the motor world, would you say there was a personality typical style there? Um, well, obviously, uh, you know, like you, I'm a disc practitioner and we work together. So, you know, I know all the sort of four styles and predominantly, what, what, yeah, I mean, you see a real mix of all four styles. 
um, and they all operate differently. So, for example, starting in reverse order, um, you know, those sales execs, for example, who are very, very good with paperwork, their admin is is spot on. You know, they'll they'll analyze the needs of a customer and they'll tune into a customer that's done all the research and everything else. So, so there's a good mix of blues in there. Um, there are quite a lot of, of the greens, you know, the steadies that uh, are, are all about the relationship and wanting to make f- lots of friends. Um, but equally, there are a lot of very flamboyant, very outgoing um, sales execs in particular who are high yellow. <clears throat> the issue, as you've already pointed out with that, is the rejection. Mm. Uh, and what we've what I found looking back on it is that the people that have tended to rise to the more senior positions and which is which has just fed the culture over years have been the high reds right because they're driven they're determined they want the results they want it now and of course the 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 bosses and the upper echelons see them as well these are the good leaders these are the people I want running my business because they're they're just going to go for the numbers um and so if you go around a lot of dealerships now you'll find that a lot of the senior management quite often men nearly always men um you know if you did a, a disc profile on them you'd find that they were high high reds mm. um and then of course you go into the service department and you've got mechanics in there who are you know very detail oriented like the the process and so on so uh the blues in there and and similarly the ones that rise up to become more managerial tend to be the ones that are you know aimed a bit more in the red direction mm. Um, and just p- picking up what you said there about the fact that the the reds are the ones that go to the top and the reds are the ones that people go, oh, these all make great leaders. We know between ourselves and, and, and other people, obviously, at Disfratish, is that reds don't always make the best leaders. But quite often, if they are the ones that are pushing and driving for the results, I can definitely see it in the motor trade where they think, actually, this is a dealership. This is all about the numbers. Or I just need to push the numbers. Whereas actually what we what we've got to think about is a, is the people side of things so you know the, that green side of things which we know in disc terms is opposite to the red so do you feel that perhaps greens in the motor trade would get overlooked because they're not loud i think less so as time is going on um and there's lots of movement now around sort of you know gender balance and diversity and inclusion you know, a lot of work going on in the industry that around that because they recognise that there's an issue. But I think one of the things that we do have that's a big issue as well, um, and I've actually got, as if it's one I prepared earlier, a big what, report a big issue? by the... Eh? A big issue. A big... <laughs> not yet, not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm getting mine delivered. Um, but <laughs> there's a report by the IMI, which should give them a plug. That's the Institute of the Motor Industry, which is like the professional body. And there's one word that's repeated in that report several times, and that's homophily. And what it basically, that's homophily, and what it basically means is um, recruiting your own likeness. Oh, okay, yeah. If you go round to any automotive business in the country, increasingly less so, but you walk in and it's full of short, fat, bald blokes like me. So for those of you... I was going to say, for those of you who are listening to this, Stephen has just described himself. I would call him a short, fat, bald bloke. Um, a short, you bald are... bloke. That... <laughs> <laughs> when I... You are you are follically challenged, Stephen. Follically yeah. and vertically challenged, as it, I'm reminded when I'm standing next to your wonderful husband. <laughs> yes. And my truck. And your truck, yes. Um, <laughs> but you, I mean, that um, homophily, well, that's a great word, isn't it? You do Good find uh, that there, there's lots of businesses because we tend to, don't we? We tend to migrate to people who are very similar to us. And what we have to remember is that that's great. And perhaps in friendship terms and when you're in your personal life, absolutely get, hang out with all those people that you don't need to make an effort with. But actually in the workplace, and it's not just the car industry, wherever you are in the workplace, we know we need to have a variety now, I'm going to pick up on something else, which um, so it was a conversation that Stephen and I had listeners before we actually got on here, because under pressure, you change from your sunshine. The, and if you're not again, shining you're, now, is it? You yeah, exactly. It. For those uh, for those of you who are listening, the sun is just streaming through Stephen's <laughs> through windows window. now. He's now got a very, very, very bright face. Um, but yes, your sunshine yellow t- tends to disappear, doesn't it? And and you describe yourself 
Um, well, I'll let you describe yourself when you're under pressure. Oh, what word can I use? Keep um, it clean, please. It rhymes with glass. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I mean, I once had a manager who described me back then as when under extreme pressure, I'm like a cornered rat that will eventually just reach out and scratch or bite something verbally, of course, not, not physically. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I don't, I, I've never quite put that down. Maybe I need some sort of therapy, but then maybe I'm never understood exactly why that is. I think it's because you, as you said, you know, you live on energy and enthusiasm and optimism fear rejection massively hate any kind of abandonment um and so you 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 know you get to a point where that my next is the red so on on a disc profile i'm a high eye but with red very close behind which kind of means that as a as a leader what i'm what i'm all about is the vision and the creativity and the ideas but i've come up with an idea and i want it now yeah and if i don't get it now then there's every possibility that i will either move on and think about the next shiny new toy to come in front of me mm -hmm. or be distracted. Um, <clears throat> or I will really, really dig my heels in and, and then, you, you know, you'll see a very assertive uh, and um, driven individual. Yeah. That, you know, and, and back that up with this, you know, what I believe are my standards, my values Mm -hmm. uh, and so on now what i'm very aware of is that from a, and this is something i tell leaders when i do disc work as well is if you only ever behave in that one style you're actually you're in a, you're going to appeal to 25 percent of the people but you're going to alienate 75 percent mm. and from experience and from having done that over the years i'm very well aware of as you said earlier to me before we started recording that uh i'm, I'm much more self-aware now. Well, that thing. So, when did you become self-aware? Uh, well, a divorce helped. Okay. Um, <laughs> going through everything I did in 2020, leading to the creation of my baby, which is Menable, um, that helped. I think I was kind of self-aware before that, but yeah, it's. I think it's a work in progress. I think it's an increasing thing, and I think as I get older, I'm. I'm not just becoming more self-aware. I'm becoming more discerning in who and what I take direction and guidance from. Well, I'm going to challenge you on that a bit because that's not so much in terms of personality styles, is it? That's more about your core values mm -hmm. on, on where you, 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 I mean, you're, you strive for fairness. Mm -hmm. um, would you say? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, fairness, um, integrity, honesty, um, you know, I mean, we overuse the word authentic, but the more authentic someone is for, to me, the more endearing I find it. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not authentic or they're not honest, then part of my style will kind of look for, you know, well, well why is that? You know, and if I can help them, then then I will do my best to help them. But if, if they dig their heels in and go the other way, and then it becomes a, a I don't want to say a battle because that's a strong word, but you know what I mean? Conflict. Then I uh, yeah. Then I will. Contentious. Yeah. I will pick on the on the red and will dig my heels in and stay exactly where I am. Stubborn mule. <laughs> to keep it clean. Um. So let me. A yeah, lovely let me stubborn mule. I'm like, I'm like the don <laughs> more like the donkey in Shrek. You are. You are. I have been described as the donkey in Shrek by Bev James from the Coaching Academy, <laughs> uh, which I took as a compliment. Uh, but it actually did make me realise that yeah, do you know what the donkey from Shrek and Tigger is is a wonderful character, <laughs> but it's not needed twenty four seven. So let me challenge you on the honesty value, because have you ever? Um, only because I challenge my own honesty value, not, you know, on the big stuff, but on the little things like my husband, as you well know, you know, Mark. Um, so say if we're in the office together, so some of the time I work for him as um, his business partner in Heath Construction, and I can see that his phone's ringing and I'll just be like, are you going to get that? And he'll just be like, oh, he said, can you just take it and tell them that I'm on site somewhere and I've left my phone at home? And I do. And I just pick it up and go, oh, you know, hi, blah, blah. Oh, no, sorry, Mark's not around. He's left his phone at home, so he's on site. You know, you'll have to catch him tomorrow. And I put the phone down. 
that that's not honest because Mark's sitting right next to me. <laughs> so surely I need to challenge my honesty value because on the big stuff, yes, but what you'd call the little white lies, I'm not always honest. So does that mean that actually I can't really have honesty as a value? Oh, I think we're all guilty of that, aren't we? We all do a, a version of that. I mean, you know, it's that whole, whole kind of friend invites you out for a, a drink and you're like, oh, do you know what? I've made other plans. Well, no, you haven't. You just don't fancy going out. You want to sit indoors with your feet up. You know, it's You've the got same. Hogo. I've got Hogo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. For listeners, so think... if you haven't heard of Hogo, it's <clears throat> H-O-G-O, hassle of going out. It's, I only learned that the other week. Yeah. But, yes. but like you say, we're all guilty of it. But so can we, you know, can we really look at that honesty value and just say, what does honor, because honesty to you and honesty to me, yes, I'm not going to go and rob a bank. You know, that's mm. apart from the fact it's illegal, but it's dishonest, you know. And so there is there is a real thing around that honesty value. And I do challenge my clients when they come up with it. And I generally use that phone scenario because we've all yeah, done yeah. that. Well, and yeah, definitely. And certainly in the work that I do around DISC as well with you, that I, I've i learned that, you know, there are certain traits, uh, personality types that are more prone to not necessarily telling you what they really think or what they're wanting to do or or whatever. And and I, I do what I can to make them aware that, look, that that may be coming across as a bit passive aggressive at best and dishonest at worst. Mm. Um, so as a high red, you know, if somebody's got, I mean, I'm very well aware of that and I'm very well aware that I can be very, you know, blunt and to the point. I don't think I am most of the time, but I can revert, revert to that if, if necessary, or if pushed as we, as we've said, if somebody finds an issue with that, I'd rather they came to me and said, look, Steve, you know, I know you were excited and what have you, but some of the words you chose there might have been a bit, um, mm poorly chosen or clumsy or whatever i'd rather hear that than have you know than, than it come back around to me three months later when someone says oh so and so said this that and the other about you really well and i think that's definitely a challenge in terms of you, you're talking about um the reds and the greens being polar mm. opposites but sometimes when we're red and i know because i know under pressure i go very red but i also know that if I can come across as quite rude and aggressive when I'm very red to a green, then that green is not going to challenge me there and then because no, they right. they don't want change. They don't want that. They will come across as a bit passive aggressive and they'd rather then perhaps talk to somebody else about what they thought their opinion was. And we all know what opinions are. You know, they're like um, the bottoms we release things out of. Everybody's got one. Exactly. <laughs> um but but because they feel that they need to um, pacify themselves, like was I in the wrong? Should I have said something? Should, should and then and then suddenly that person has a conversation. We know what it's like. It's it, I mean I'm going to say gossip, but even not that. It's just it's the Chinese whispers, isn't it? And then suddenly it comes back to you, but from somebody who wasn't involved in that conversation. You're like that's not exactly what actually was said. Mm -hmm. um, but people especially if it came back to somebody who was perhaps red, who thought, oh, well, Stephen wouldn't be happy if he knew that. So I'm going to tell him what's been said, just not from a gossipy point of view, but from a a, a point of view of caring about you as well and just need yeah. you needing to know. And it's just like, why didn't you say something to me at the start? And it's we as reds need to understand that if we are with people who are green, it's just even just softening the voice you know, and, and perhaps slowing down a little bit. So I've mm. got a point to make, but if I made it with a softer voice and a slower tone, it wouldn't come across as if I'm really, really, if I'm, if my voice is harsh, like I'm talking now and I'm speeding up, then all I'm doing is making that green fearful of actually saying anything. Mm. But if my voice is soft and slower, then the green is more likely to join in. Yeah. Now, and now, so interestingly, over the years, one of the things that I've found when I've been sort of coaching people is I've had, quite a bit of success with with people who are very very high red mm. um because you know once they're it's pointed out to them that your behavior you know at, at worst you come across as a bully mm. you know or you could be seen as belligerent you know now firstly let's accept that actually that you're not a bully and you're not belligerent but that's the way people are seeing you because they're looking through their green lens or their blue lens or whatever <clears throat> but if you're aware of that then that's when you can you know, tone that down, use it when you need to. 
Yeah. Um, and I think really, I mean, I I don't think I use the red part of me as much as well. Maybe maybe I do. <laughs> Other people might feel differently, but I don't think I do. But I think what I do do with it is it's a bit of a defense mechanism. Yeah. I, I the, see it in you when when you when you do when you are starting to be backed into a corner. I definitely see the red starting to come out, and we've had conversations. All right, Steve, Steve, no, you just need to <laughs> take a deep breath and understand where that person's coming from. And and this is what this is all about, isn't it? That's the whole podcast is called. It starts with you because it's about yeah. our impact on other people. Because we can't change other people, but we can look in the mirror and understand the impact that we're having on the people around us. And also then be very aware. And if you haven't listened to it yet, go back and listen to the podcast with um, Heather Wright, because she talks about um, our behavioural habits. You know, habits we always think of as biting our nails, smoking, drinking, that kind of stuff. But actually, when we think about the behavioural habits, like like you say, you go very red when you're backed into a corner. But it's actually, let me look at the trigger. What's making me red? Right, let's just step away from that and come back in as a sunshine yellow because mm. I'll react to that very, very differently. Yeah, uh, no, that's a good point. I mean, in in the last car dealership that I, I ran as a, a called a dealer principal, so it's like the general manager, um, and I ran this dealership, and I and you know my team used to, they nicknamed it a wit and wonderland because <laughs> they they just knew that <laughs> you know I, I would be sitting in my office, and if they were with a customer, I'd come sauntering out and I'd sprinkle some fairy dust over it and metaphorically and and start talking to people and grabbing coffees and and they were like well you know we've never had a general manager who did all of that they're normally sat in there glued to a spreadsheet and I said, well that's not me i'm going to be you know this is about giving customers joyous experiences but by contrast when i'm in the meeting in the morning you know it's anyone turns up for me and i i made this very clear we we open the doors at half past eight so at 20 past eight you're late because that 10 minutes is the time that you go to the loo, hang up your coat, get a cup of tea, sit down, turn on your computer. You don't do that at 8.29 and then you've got 10 minutes worth of customers waiting while you're getting set up. That, And I, and I used to have some people go boss-eyed at me and it's like, how can you, you know, we don't start till half eight. No. You, <laughs> and that that's the contrast, you know what I mean? So on the one hand, you get the the, the sauntering around, skipping around the showroom, humming to the tune that's playing sprinkling fairy dust and on the other hand you get the well don't these are my expectations mm. you know it, it says in the company handbook you wear a blue or black or gray suit and the, and black shoes brown shoes with a navy blue suit is a fashion faux pas end of right mm. that's another conversation <laughs> well it is another conversation but just <laughs> ask anyone who's got wedding photos that in 30 years time they look back on and they go who's the idiot in the brown shoes they're not looking at <laughs> They're not looking at how beautiful the bride was. Is that one person in, the, in there is wearing brown shoes with a navy blue suit? So that's just, just do you know what I mean? It's yeah, yeah, no, not absolutely. Save the world, is it that? But <laughs> no, no, I, I'm with you though, and that's that's all about timekeeping and image and all, all that kind of behaviors. stuff and, and behaviors, behaviors. behavioral habits. Yeah, my husband does the same. So as I said earlier, you know, Heath Construction. So he's got a, um, a small. Um, family run business of builders and that we start at 8 a.m and if you turn up at 8 a.m you are starting work if you want to start and you want to turn up and you want to have a brew and you want to chat you get here at quarter to eight that's Absolutely. fine we start work at eight o'clock the choice is yours you want to brew mm -hmm. and you want to chat to everyone you get here at quarter to eight if not 100%. you're here at eight and you go to start work yeah. And and I've had people who just, you know, they've turned up and they've looked and, and they went, oh, do you want to get a cup? I'm like, no, you've turned up at eight o'clock. You know the <laughs> rules. And they soon yeah. start turning up 10 minutes. What is 10 minutes? Yeah. It's really, yeah. it's really not a lot. Mm. No. So um, tell me about your childhood. Oh, my word. Which bit? Do, what do you think of personalities and behaviours from your childhood? Well, has that got anything to do with me wearing a, a Sigmund Freud T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> today it's got pink freud on it by the way listeners if you're not if you're not watching the video um oh my childhood well very i'll, I'll do a kind of whistle stop version uh my mum was 17 when she had me my dad was only a couple of years older uh they didn't have any money whatsoever so we i remember just growing up as a toddler and then sort of up to I was about five living with my grandparents um who also at the time still had um, teenage children because my mum was 
the middle one. So she had a young, much younger brother who was probably only about 10 when I was born. Uh, so I think without knowing it, I look back on that and think, yeah, I was surrounded by jealousy and, you know, suddenly there's a baby in the house and I was the center of attention. Um, and so on the one hand, I'm getting everything I want from my grandparents, but I'm getting rejected and, and left alone by my uncle who was only about 10 or 11 at the time. <clears throat> Didn't know that obviously. Um, and, uh, and, and my dad, you know, just purely cause he was, he was probably not old enough, I think on reflection mm. to, to deal with it. So, um, so how have those behaviors, cause we talk about that, you know, this is personalities and different disc types, but actually if we look at the different layers of the onion, as I call it, that make us who we are, those kind of behaviors impact us, especially from a very, very early age. Hundred percent. I mean, I I then went on to uh, be an only child till I was six. My mum had four miscarriages and then had a had a baby girl, um, which was obviously my sister. And then two years later, had a boy. Uh, so I'm a little bit older than my brother and sister. And I think, yeah, if I if I was sort of doing a, a Sigmund Freud analysis on myself, I think my behavioural traits and personality come from the need to keep myself front and centre of of attention you know, amongst this very sort of disparate group of adults um, in an environment that probably, if you look at it nowadays, you probably wouldn't be conducive to bringing children up in that environment. Um, you know, dad, who was, who was largely absent for a good proportion of my life until I was late in my late teens. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and of course, couple that with culturally, it was the 70s and 80s and things were very different then um so always on the one hand felt I was a bit of a loner I was always very much more happy being on my own being on uh, you know um I didn't make friends easily as a, as a child and certainly not as a teenager I just had a very small group of friends which is actually not what you would describe as a yellow personality mm. style when you think mm. about what you what you are now you know you love being surrounded by people you you mm. you make friends easily you 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 know I think of the time socially that we've been out, you know, you're, you've always chatting to somebody new. You're very like, much like my, my husband, Mark, aren't you? You know, when the three of us go out, I'm like literally in Billy no mates on my own and you and Mark are just off talking to everyone. But that's, you've just described somebody that's very different from what you had as a childhood. So where do you think you made the switch in your life to be more yellow? Um, do you know what? I mean, I can talk openly about this because my parents are no longer with us and no one's going to, this isn't going to haunt me in any way. Um, when I was about 14, 13, no, about 14, I think, my parents went through a really bad patch marriage wise. We we all, we'd lived, moved out of my grandparents' house, had our own house, a council house by then. Um, and obviously I've got a much younger brother and sister at this stage. I'm 14. I've got a sort of, you know, brother and sister that are only just starting school. <clears throat> my parents went through a bad phase. My mum had an affair and they decided that in order to save their marriage, that they would suddenly change their working pattern and work on the same shift so that they spent more time together and, and you know, restored their relationship. Uh, I don't think it ever really did. Um, but what it did do for me was it meant that I then became the sort of the, the permanent babysitter. So one week, I was taking my brother and sister to school in the morning and the next week I was picking them up in the evening uh, from school, taking them home, cooking them dinner and I had to have a dinner in the oven for my parents when they got home at 10 o'clock at 14. And at the same time, I was in a school that was rough. It wasn't academically known for its achievements. And I think during that year, that was the year, what was that, 1980? Uh, that was the year that I was probably, and you know this bit as well, this other bit of me, really starting to get curious about the world and looking around and going, oh, she's nice. Oh, but he's nice as well. <laughs> and in my mind going, oh, there's something wrong with me. And what, what can I do to get out of this? <laughs> and uh, I don't know, something must have clicked and I knuckled down and I got on with my academic studies. And I do remember it being commented on that I went back into the what was the third year of secondary school and teachers were commenting and like, well, what have you done with the old Steve Witten? Because, you know, you, you were close to being expelled at one point, having fights and putting kids through windows and all sorts of stuff I was doing. And then the following year I went back and there was me all smart and suited and booted and ready to knuckle down and learn and uh, walked out of there with nine O levels. 
mm-hmm. uh, which was a major achievement for a school like that. So somewhere in all of that, something clicked and made me go, no, I need to be in control of how I do this. I don't. I didn't sit down and think that because I was only 14, 15 at the time, but I think that's what, what kind of happened. And I think from there, that's where I then became the, right, so the yellow is the thing that gets me the attention, the laughs, the the interest, and that is the natural me to be flamboyant and out there uh, and make people laugh and, and enjoy my company. But the red is the very much the protection. Right, if, if that doesn't work for me, I'm just going to go for it and I'm driven and determined. Mm-hmm. which I think is where that where that came from. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um but then challenging that the that the red squashed what you felt at 14 that then actually came back and turned your world upside down because it came back out again because you can't hide it. Well, no, exactly. And that's back to the point about the being honest and, and all the rest of it, because, you know, maybe it's a it's a yellow red thing that, it you know, is only so long that you can not be authentic. Mm. And I don't go out of my way to upset anyone or hack anyone off or say anything that's belligerent or bullish or whatever that, that you know, I'm not going to put that down to just my personality trait because clearly I'm in control of that. But I think for so long what that helped me to the personality trait helped me to create a persona that wasn't the real me Mm. um and i look back on it now and i think actually there was if i think about the reasons why my mum and dad asked me to look after my brother and sister um it's almost like i was maybe my mum knew and i look at it and i think maybe i was a bit of a gift of nature to my mum you know, she was very, very young. I mean, my she there she was, 30 years old with a 14-year-old son. Mm. I couldn't have coped with that when I was 30. You know, I was much older than that when my boys were were that sort of age. Mm. Um, and and so she did remarkably well. And I just think that I was there to help her out. And the mm. fact that I now know that I, you know, I was clearly much more in, ch- in touch with the ability to have feminine traits as well as masculine traits um which is bizarre given what we're talking about about being driven and determined because you know me well and i am very much in touch with my feminine side Mm. Uh, and i think that's you know if i'd have had the the honesty to say to her at the time this is who i am and what i'm about i think she'd have loved it Mm. i'm going to wrap this conversation at that point because i think otherwise we'll probably both cry um but it's it's been a real interesting conversation um and for any of those that are listening and want to reach out to to Stephen to you know talk more about that kind of stuff and the honesty side um or find out more about Stephen where Stephen where can they get hold of you uh well I'm all over LinkedIn as you know Stephen J Whitten all over that like a rash so I've come over all camp now I'm being me mele- <laughs> Now I've opened up properly at the end. Um, yeah, so I'm all over LinkedIn, or you can contact me at stephen.witten at menable.org or stephenjwitten.co.uk or my menable website, which is menable.org. And that's actually, it's not menable, it's enable with an M, by the way, just in case the, uh, you know, anyone well, was wondering, it's just for men. I shall make sure that we put all of those details in the show notes so people can find you because it is Stephen with a PH, not a V. So Indeed. I'll make sure that they're all in there. Stephen, it's been insightful as always. I love you dearly. Thank you for being in my world. Thank you. Thank you for being my friend. And please, listeners, if um, you need to get in contact, please do get in contact or drop us a comment when you've heard this, read this about actually what uh, what's really impacted you. And in the the meantime, can I now go off and suck a fisherman's friend? Yes, because you do need that for your throat. I do indeed. Thank you. (laughs) Take care. See you. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What have you learnt? What will you do differently? Do leave a review on Apple or Spotify on It Starts With You podcast. And also leave a comment down below. Do also then connect with me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. And why not even join the Facebook group? It starts with you and keep the learning ongoing. Thank you for listening.